really matters? That might be the most important question you can ask. So let's talk about it. Welcome to What Really Matters podcast, Everyday Spirituality with Karen Wyatt. Today, I want to thank you for joining me here. I have another interesting episode today and a very personal subject to talk about. I'm, I'm speaking about how to cope with bad news. And I have promised you in this podcast that I'm sharing with you information that comes from my own life day to day right now as I'm living it in this moment. And that is what this episode is all about. That is where it begins and where it ends today. The topic I'm going to discuss with you because just recently, over the past couple of weeks, I have received the bad news that a friend of mine has a brain tumor. And I had seen her just like 36 hours before the MRI revealed the brain tumor. And it's so interesting how in one moment, everything is perfectly fine. Everything's totally normal. And we're laughing and talking together. We're making plans for traveling we want to do together in the future for the next time we will see one another. And then such a short time later, an MRI is done and the brain tumor that had been there for a while is revealed. And so there has been this hidden secret in a way happening within her that we were completely unaware of for so many moments, for so many encounters together. And then suddenly it is known. The presence of this life-threatening tumor is revealed. And of course, it changes everything in a single instant as soon as that picture materializes in the radiology department, the truth is revealed, the truth is known. And so together, we and many other people in her life who love her have been dealing with this bad news about the brain tumor and worse news that it is not benign. It is, in fact, one of the most lethal types of tumors that it could be. So uh, compounding bad news that has had to be delivered over these few weeks. And I thought back to some of the episodes I've done in the past talking about why do bad things happen? And just last week, I talked about why do we die? And so I have emphasized in the past that in some ways, there really are not things that happen in our lives that we can label necessarily as being bad or good. I've talked about how when we take the galaxy view and when we look at the long view of life, everything blends together and there isn't really necessarily a bad thing or a good thing. It's just what is. But I want to say in this moment, and I purposely titled this episode Coping with Bad News, because in the moment when you first become aware of something, it feels bad. And there's no way around it. It just feels bad. And as we're coping with this information and looking to the future with all of this confusion and uncertainty, it's challenging, it's difficult, and it feels bad even though I know that it may not always seem that way. I know that there will be other perspectives to take, other views of what is happening right now. I'll be able to look back at some point in the future. I will have much more information. I will see how this is going to, to play out. And I already know because of my belief system that no matter what comes, and, and this is based on my experience in life and in hospice, no matter what is to come, what is going to happen, I, I know there will be mercy, there will be grace, there will be transformation. 
amidst the grief and the pain and the tragedy of what is going to come over the next few weeks and months. I know that for certain because I've experienced it over and over again. So from the vantage point I have right now, while I'm looking out into the void again at unanswered questions and the unknown of how this will all unfold, I do know that there will be beauty even during the ugliest times and even when our hearts are broken. I know that there will be transformation in transcendence that will happen. And so I always have that hope. I always have that knowledge deep within me. And yet, nonetheless, in this moment, the news is bad and it feels bad right now in this moment as I hold it and carry it. So I want to emphasize that because I realize perhaps in the past I've implied that it's wrong to think of something as bad or to experience it and have negative emotions about what's happening. And that's not the truth. What's most important is that we feel all of our feelings, whatever they are in the moment, and allow all of them to be there. So I want to make sure that in the past I haven't made it sound like we should eliminate feeling bad about the events of life and how life unfolds sometimes, that it's perfectly fine to feel whatever we feel. It's only in the higher view, the galaxy view, and in retrospect many times that sometimes what felt bad in the moment begins to fade and begins to blend in with the goodness and the beauty of life as well. So I wanted to explain that this is bad news. And it feels very bad to have to hold it right now. And so one of the things that I'm working on is how to be a support person for my friend during this time of challenge and how to do the best possible job that I can do in this moment. How do I hold space along with her, side by side with her? How do I embrace the challenge of this experience, of this bad news? And how do I walk through it and journey through it with her? So I've thought of some kind of some suggestions for me, for myself, that I'm working with as I figure out how do I react from moment to moment? What do I say? How do I be here? What do I do? And so first of all, I recognize that I need to feel my own pain and at the same time be open to her pain. And she has described to me that there are people in her life who she feels are asking her to support them, who are expressing their pain to her so much that she almost feels she can't attend to her own because she somehow needs to make other people feel better who are bringing their own grief and their own distress to her. And so I'm acutely aware of that and looking at what I say, how I behave, what is my agenda, what is my attention, am I asking her at any time to make me feel better because that's not her job. She is the person coping with all of this uncertainty, with all of these conflicting emotions arising within her, and her only job is to work on her path and the choices she has to make and to just manage to get through moment to moment and day to day and and find her very best path through all of that. She should not have to worry about how other people are experiencing what's happening to her. So I'm acutely aware that I need to be responsible for my own pain and manage it and feel it all, not try to bury it, feel it in any way I need to feel it and therefore acknowledge when it feels bad. And as I said before, be open to her pain and allow her pain in to carry her pain along with my pain if that's what she needs from me. And then 
I recognize also I need to be able to offer support to her, but find my own support at the same time, not from her. I need to make sure that there are other people in my life who can give me support when I need it. And maybe there are other people uh, around her that may need my support as well. So it's a it's a joint combined effort between all of us who are creating a safe space for her to connect with one another and make sure each of us feel supported as well without, again, asking her to be the support person for any of us. So I'm trying to look out for myself and take care of myself as best I can. And I'm, I'm trying to actually go outside the circle of people who know my friend to seek some support from others in my life who are not being affected by what she's experiencing. Third, I'm trying to learn how to be present, but allow plenty of space and solitude. So one thing my friend has let me know is that she needs time to herself in order to process what's happening. I understand that not everyone at a time like this is looking for solitude. Some people want to be distracted. They need others around them. They don't want to have too much time to think because their thoughts may take them to a dark place. But my friend has said she needs time and space just in order to grasp all of this that's going on. And she gets overwhelmed if people are too present for her. And so I understand within me, there's an urge to want to be there. There's an urge to want to show up, to want to text and call and be offering help all the time. And I recognize though, I have to respect that she doesn't always need help and doesn't always need someone to be there. She's a person who may more often need that quiet time And so I'm figuring out how to offer support without pushing support on her and how to be sensitive and tuned in to what I hear from her that she needs. And I'll explain a little bit more about what I mean by that. So number three is being present, but allowing for space and solitude and just being tuned in and that my need for connection or even for information sometimes, uh, is not the top priority. It's figuring out what she needs at the time and then learning how to be patient. If, If I would like to feel more connection, but it's not what she needs at the time, waiting until the timing is right. And so number four, following from that, it is learning how to sit with my own questions and my own uncertainty, because there have been times when I know she may have had a meeting with the doctor or someone in the doctor's office. I know that she may have received information, but I'm not hearing anything about it. And I also know that that's my job to sit with the unknown and the uncertainty and wait until the timing is right for her to pass on that information. And so it's a really good exercise. All of us actually in our lives need to get used to being in the dark with questions in our minds without answers to those questions and learning how to cope with that uncertainty and cope with the unknown and not knowing what is going to happen next. So this has been a really good exercise, as I said, in patience and waiting, knowing you know, the future is going to reveal itself to me moment by moment. And I have to just allow that. I have to surrender and allow it to show me what is coming next whenever that happens and not demand answers or wish for answers before they can be given. And number five, I'm thinking about 
being brave enough to go deep, brave enough to have these conversations about death and what that looks like and the dying process, what it might consist of, talking about saying goodbye and letting go of life, all these really challenging and hard issues. And then in the very same conversation, being light enough to be able to laugh, to be silly, to to share humor and jokes together. And so it requires being authentic in the moment and being fully there and bringing all of my faculties together, maybe all the skills I've honed in terms of being a good listener and being able to talk about death and dying and keeping with me at the same time in that moment my sense of humor so that I don't get lost in the depths and in the darkness, but can also carry in the light and be nimble enough to move from one place to the other, depending on her lead where she needs to go. And also being able to hold on to hope and reality simultaneously. And I've done some episodes on my other podcast, End of Life University, on the conundrum of hope at the end of life and how hope can be harmful if it is hope that's not based in reality, if it's hope in a fantasy. It can harm us because it can keep us from dealing with reality and actually taking care of business and actually having the conversations we need to have, making the plans that we need to make. And so... It's very interesting to watch my own mind and observe what happens for me because at some point in the very beginning of this process, her doctor said something about having a patient who lived as long as 20 years and that number 20 years immediately became embedded in my brain and it comes up constantly in my thoughts but 20 years what about 20 years what about 20 years it's very interesting to me how we are just wired to hold on to the most optimistic most hopeful information that we hear even though subsequently every other piece of information has been much different than that and has been much more negative, much more limited in terms of the time that's possible. And yet still 20 years is in my mind every day in the back of my mind and this hope for 20 years, 20 years, 20 years. So I realize that we are dealing with our brains that operate in a certain way that attached to certain information, perhaps, even though our own conscious thought can override that and say, however, I know that in this case, that is not really a likelihood, like that number isn't even really possible now at this point. So it's very interesting to me just watching my own process within my own brain and how I put all of these pieces of information together and and what I end up focusing on day to day. So the 20 years, that number is in the back of my mind, but in the front of my mind is the reality, which actually I talk about all the time, that none of us knows how much time we have here on this planet. None of us has any idea when we will die or how soon we might die. And so I know that as the absolute reality that there is no certainty, there's no guarantee of any certain amount of time in life. And so to put a number like 20 years out there is is a little bit foolish. I realize that. Yet at the same time, I see my own mind just holding it, holding that number and holding on to it. Um, as if there is some sort of comfort or solace there. So I'm allowing that. I'm allowing thinking about 20 years (laughs) to be in the back of my mind, even while I'm reviewing the reality and the real statistics of what's happening and seeing what is unfolding day to day. So I guess sometimes we, we cling to whatever 
whatever tiny little thread or strand of hope might be offered, even when it isn't realistic. And I see that now. I see how that has a place in my thoughts and in my mind, and I'm allowing that to be there. Because at the same time, I do believe that miracles are possible. I have seen miracles. And so I would never discount the the possibility that something amazing or incredible could happen, something absolutely unexpected could happen. And I actually think that miracles happen anyway, miracles not related to a cure or total healing for someone, but miracles happen in the moment every day over and over again anyway. So I believe in all the small miracles that could be present within this situation. And so again, in this moment, I'm working on, as I said, allowing hope and reality to be present simultaneously and knowing that miracles unfold in the moment and miracles are likely to happen even if there isn't a cure and even if... The time that remains is short. So I want to end this by talking about what I am doing in in this moment, how I am coping with the bad news. And then I have just a poem to read as well. And so it turns out that my friend has written a novel. She's been working on it for the last four years and has been trying to find a publisher, but unable to find one. And so I have decided to help her by publishing her novel for her, self-publishing it, because I've done that with my own books in the past, and so I know how to do it. So together, she and I are working on this project. She hired a cover designer and an interior designer to work with her, And we're coming together as a team to finish up her book and to bring it into the world, hopefully in early July. That's our plan, to publish this book so that she will have this knowledge that her precious novel is out into the world and she can feel a completion at least of this project that she started and that she feels so excited and so positive about. So for me, it is really helpful to have something positive that I can do for her, a way to actually support and help her in something that's good, that's productive, and that is going to make the world a better place, a legacy for her to leave. And for her, it's also giving her a tremendous sense of meaning and resolution and completion for her life, which I know is very, very important. So I'm excited even as I'm uh, grieving over the bad news and the losses that are occurring right now, but extremely grateful and feeling blessed that I'm able to step up and be helpful in this moment, there is something actually tangible and significant that I can do right now to make a difference. I'm telling you about this right now because in the future, when the book comes out, I'm going to be asking everyone to please buy the ebook. We're going to price it really low. I'm just asking everyone Um, because it would be so amazing for my friend to see her novel have some sales. So I'm just going to be asking people, would you consider it as a favor um, to buy the ebook of her her novel so that she can see that people have purchased it and um, know that it's truly out there in the world. But I will mention that later. That will come up again. So... As I prepare to close, I wanted to mention one other thing that I performed the marriage for my friend and her husband, and it was a marriage later in life, a coming together after many years, meeting each other early in life and then coming together much later. And one part of the wedding was reading the poem Santiago by David White, and that poem describes being on a journey 
that brings you full circle in a way, brings you around to where you have always been, a path you have always been on, but you didn't recognize. And it was a really beautiful, perfect poem for their marriage, describing the journey the two of them have been on to come together. And so I found another David White poem that I'm going to read that is bringing me some comfort right now. This is again from his book Pilgrim, which all of these poems were written about the Camino de Santiago. And so he's describing here in this poem, Finisterre, the ending of the Camino, uh, where you end up when you finish the entire pilgrimage along that path. And so I'm going to just read this poem because it is bringing me comfort right now. And I think it describes a place to be and a way to think about what, what is happening here. So Finisterre by David White. The road in the end taking the path the sun had taken into the western sea and the moon rising behind you as you stood where ground turned to ocean no way to your future now, but the way your shadow could take. Walking before you across water, going where shadows go. No way to make sense of a world that wouldn't let you pass, except to call an end to the way you had come. To take out each frayed letter you brought and light their illumined corners and to read them as they drifted through the late western light. To empty your bags, to sort this and to leave that, to promise what you needed to promise all along, and to abandon the shoes that had brought you here, right at the water's edge, not because you had given up, but because now you would find a different way to tread. And because through it all, part of you could still walk on, no matter how, over the waves. And so I'll say goodbye with that poem and thank you for listening in and being here with me in a way uh, to hear this story and to hear me talk about this process I'm going on because you actually are being part of my support network if I being deep listeners for me and being present for me as you listen to this episode so I want to thank you and I will be back here next week and hope you'll join me once again until then remember that we're here for love's and so I'm relying on love so much right now. Love is the thing that helps us get through anything and everything. And we should never forget that. So face your fear. Be ready for whatever life brings you next because everything can change in an instant. And love each and every precious moment of your life. <laughs>